Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. We now turn, and I'm with you on your hymnal on page 4243, we now turn to Joan Aiken's text, Sonata for Harp and Bicycle, which let's just say it out loud, that's a very strange title. And obviously Aiken is doing this intentionally. We're going to come back to exactly why it would be the case that this would uh, be a text with such a strange title. Speaking of titles, and we clearly want to write down it to be, that that's going to be one of the questions that we have to answer, right? Because there are two kinds of texts that we study. One, the titles are self-evident. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, well, that tells you that we will be looking at a text about Tom Sawyer. But there will be other texts, like this one, that will have this strange title, Sonata for Harp and bicycle, whatever sonata is supposed to mean. For the musical uh, aficionados in the house, you know a little bit about this term already. We're going to obviously have to ask, what is up with this title? And at the end of the story, we'll try and make some connections. But I'm with you right now on page 43. And I'm with you at level 2B. You notice how regularly we start our inquiry of texts at level 2B. And notice under the literary analysis, we want to make sure that we've written down this information about plot. Now, in an earlier lecture that was the introduction to freshman English, we were already talking about plot, but now we're going to review it in a bit more detail. At level 2B, let's take some quick notes. Let's say, first of all, what plot is. Write it down. Plot is the map of the story, of the text, the narrative text of the story. Okay. That is to say, we have certain stages of a fictional text. Now, the great German playwright, Dramatis Freitag, is the one who in many ways kind of instantiated this idea, and it goes way, way back in time to a great Greek philosopher named Aristotle in his treatment of poetics, great drama, that he said, all texts have a certain order to them, a certain kind of development to them. Now, this was probably taught to you sometime in middle school, I'm guessing, by showing some kind of a hill on the board that had two sides, an up and then a down side, okay? I won't write this on the whiteboard, but for your notes, I would recommend right now that you draw a little plot hill. About any story, then, we have three major kinds of understandings of divisions, a beginning, a middle, and an end, in its simplest instantiations. Go ahead and draw your little plot hill, and at the very beginning of that hill, you will want to write the first of these words provided for us, exposition. Do you see it on page 43? Exposition. There are three things usually introduced in the exposition. We've got, a, we've got an understanding of time. Is the story set today? Is the story set in the past? Is the story set in the future? We have an understanding of setting, right? Where is the story set? Are we, for example, in America? Are we on Mars? Are we in Russia? Where are we in terms of setting? And then finally, number three, write it down, we have some idea of characters. Now again, some of you maybe are asking, where exactly am I taking these notes? At level 2B. That's where these notes should be taken right now. We're talking with literary analysis, as we're talking on page 43. We're talking then about that part of the story, not what the writer says, but how the writer says it. And we're going to be looking at this thing called plot. The exposition then will give way to what we will call the rising action. The rising action is predominantly defined by the development of conflict. So let's write this down. Again, this is a review. I know it's a review for you. But let's make sure. Let's say three things about conflict. One, let's define it as the struggle or the fight within the text. Now about that struggle, number two, let's define first of all the possibility that that conflict can be an internal or an external conflict. Internal or external conflict. Well now what exactly do we mean by that? First of all, Number three, first of all, let's talk about internal conflict. Internal conflict is when the key character of the text is struggling with himself, herself, itself. All right? To try and figure out, make a decision or whatever. Should I do this? Should I not do this? 
and nobody else is involved in that decision, that is an internal conflict. External conflict involves three potentialities. We can have a character who is in conflict or struggle against another character. Okay? We can have character who is in conflict or struggle against some force of nature. These would be our stories, for example, about the guy that goes out on the mountain all alone and gets his snowmobile wrecked and the blizzard comes in and he has to keep from starving and dying by freezing to death. Of course, nature are the primary forces against which he's fighting. Finally, number three, you can have character against an idea or a group of people, we might say even culture here, as an external conflict. Now, again, just to go back, in rising action, the conflict will become clear to the reader, leading us to the next one that's listed there. That's at the apex of the hill. Write it down. This is our climax. Okay? Now, the climax. How do we define climax? Well, of course, maybe when you were younger, let's say in middle school, you like to define climax as the most exciting point in the story. But we're going to give a different definition than that because that's kind of a childish or sophomoric definition. Let's give an academic definition of climax. Climax, write this down, is the moment in the story when the conflict comes to its fruition. Some have called it, like Aristotle, the turning point of the story vis-a-vis -vis the conflict that you're focusing on. Let's make a note for your notes though right now. This is huge. Depending on which conflict you're looking at, it's possible that your reading of a text will provide a different climax. It is possible. Okay? And because some of these stories we will study will have multiple potential conflicts, there is potentially multiple different climaxes depending upon which conflict you wish to focus on. On the other side of the hill, plot hill, on the other side of the plot hill, we have the falling action. The French word is the denouement, the tying together, the bringing it all together, and then often the resolution at the end of the story, where, as they say, the conflict somehow is concluded and all loose ends are drawn together. Okay? Now, along with this information on page 43, we also have in bold two other words that we definitely want to put in our notes for our study of the two texts we're about to look at, both Sonata for Harp and Bicycle, as well as Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Imantelado. We'll be looking at both of these titles and paying attention to the literary analysis plot. Notice the words foreshadowing and suspense. I hope you have both of those written down at 2B. Let's define them quickly. Foreshadowing. Events happening earlier in the text which give you some sense that later in the text there will be importance. Okay? So something, it might be kind of subtle. And it might be something that you really don't pay very much attention to. But by the end of the story you go, oh, this is a way for the writer to try and give you a heads up. I would write that down. That's kind of what foreshadowing does. It gives you a sense of maybe what's coming. Suspense, I think most of us understand if we've ever watched very many scary movies, right? Susp suspense is the anticipation of what might happen coming forward that will ultimately be understood as maybe scary negative in some way, okay? A feeling of tension, right, is what your textbook calls it, which keeps readers wondering what will happen next. Now along with this understanding, also at 2B, we just want to make a point that we're going to be making predictions about what we think is happening next. You even will have a predictions map at the bottom of page 43 that I do recommend for both of these stories that you're kind of following. Let's turn the page to 44. We are working here with our question, Can Truth Change? For each of our previous readings, we were playing the same game in Unit 1. This is the question for us, and we come back to it periodically when we're working at level 2A. You see the vocabulary words that are listed there? Scan down through those. If you see any of those words that are unfamiliar to you, you obviously want to write those words down, and you want to be prepared to meet those words when you're reading the text itself. Now, let's, make, let's meet uh, Joan Aiken on page 45 really quickly. Note your dates right away. Let's write those down. 1924 to 2004, so she lived a very full life, notice, okay? Let's read, the daughter of an American poet, Conrad Aiken, 
and a Canadian mother, Jessie MacDonald. Joe Nakin was born in England, let's write that down, and grew up there in England. She lived with her family in an eerie old house, an experience that helped foster her fascination with mystery and the unexplained. Her, her mother's second husband was another writer, Martin Armstrong. Not surprisingly, Aiken knew when she was very young that she would become a writer someday. The family trade. Aiken began writing when she was five and published her first story at 16. After spending some time working in London for a magazine and advertising agency in the United Nations, she decided to pursue what she called the family trade. Her many literary works include novels, poems, plays, and stories for both children and adults. By the way, notice as well, Aiken did not attend a school until she was 12. Before then, she was what we would call homeschool, taught at home. Now for the background information on Sonata for Heart and Bicycle. A sonata, uh-oh, here we go, we're going to write this down, is a musical composition in several movements or parts. Sonatas are often written for solo piano or for piano and another instrument. In titling her story, Sonata for Harp and Bicycle, Joan Aiken playfully suggests a musical structure that will, like a sequence of chords, be resolved harmoniously at the end. So in other words, sonata here for harp and bicycle is being used as a metaphor of a kind. And when we finish reading the text at 2B, we'll ask maybe why specifically did she use that kind of language? All right, now here we go. I'm on page 46, 47 with you. We now turn to the text itself. We will have a reading of the text, and our job now is to follow along. As I have said in earlier lectures, can I say this out loud? This is huge for us as freshmen. Our job here is to develop ourselves as readers and as thinkers. So when the text is being read, we don't just sit and listen to someone read to us, as I said in an earlier lecture. You could do that when you were five in kindergarten, and they had story hour, and they read a text to you, and you sat and listened to the text. That is not what we're doing here. Rather, what we're doing here now is you improving your reading by following along. The challenge is, of course, to conquer monkey mind, that is to say, to overcome distractions. And one of the key ways to do that is to literally follow word for word for this story. Now, what do good readers do? They scan ahead. So I hope that you're already scanning ahead and you're seeing this story starts on page 47. And it will end, I hope you're flipping the pages as I am, and it will end, notice, over on page 56. So this is a long story, which means right away as a reader, we want to sit up and we want to pay attention to the fact, I'm going to have to give my full attention here, or monkey mind will take over, and all I'm going to be doing is just listening to the reading. This is not what we're doing in, in 303. Rather, we're trying to improve our own reading. Again, if you are, or if you are having trouble following along with the words as we read, in other words, you literally cannot point to the words to stay up, then you have to let us know so that we can begin to work with your reading fluidity and the like. Of course, comprehension is really what we're about now, yes? So we're going to read this text now. We're going to work, obviously, as we read at level one in our own notes. And when we come back, we'll work all three levels. Okay, here we go. Joan Aiken's story. Let's go ahead now and pay close attention. Sonata for Harp and Bicycle by Joan Aiken. No one is allowed to remain in the building after five o'clock, Mr. Manaby told his new assistant, showing him into the little room that was like the inside of a parcel. Why not? Directorial policy, said Mr. Manaby. But that was not the real reason. Gaunt and sooty, Grimes buildings lurched up the side of a hill toward Clerkenwell. Every little office within its dim and crumbling exterior owned one tiny crumb of light. Such was the proud boast of the architect. But toward evening, the crumbs were collected as by an immense vacuum cleaner, absorbed and demolished, yielding to an uncontrollable mass of dark that came tumbling in through windows and doors to take their place. Darkness infested the building like a flight of bats returning willingly to roost. Wash hands, please, wash hands, please. The intercom began to bawl in the passages at a quarter to five. Without much need of prompting, 
The staff hustled like lemmings along the corridors to green and blue-tiled washrooms that mocked with an illusion of cheerfulness the encroaching dusk. All papers into cases, please, the voice warned five minutes later. Look at your desks, ladies and gentlemen. Any documents left lying about, kindly put them away. Desks must be left clear and tidy. Drawers must be shut. A multitudinous shuffling, a rustling as of innumerable blue bottle flies might have been heard by the attentive ear after this injunction. As the employees of Morton Wold and Company thrust their papers into cases, hurried letters and invoices into drawers, clipped statistical abstracts together, and slammed them into filing cabinets, dropped discarded copy into waste paper baskets. Two minutes later, and not a desk throughout Grimes' buildings bore more than its customary coating of dust. Hats and coats on, please. Hats and coats on, please. Did you bring an umbrella? Have you left any shopping on the floor? At three minutes to five, the home-going throng was in the lifts and on the stairs. A clattering, staccato-voiced flood darkened momentarily the great double doors of the building. And then, as the first faint notes of St. Paul's came echoing faintly on the frosty air, to be picked up near at hand by the louder chimes of St. Biddulph's on the wall, the entire premises of Morton Wold stood empty. But why is it, Jason Ashgrove, the new copywriter, asked his secretary one day, why are the staff herded out so fast? Not that I'm against it, mind you, I think it's an admirable idea in many ways, but there is the liberty of the individual to be considered, don't you think? Hush, Miss Golden, the secretary, gazed at him with large and terrified eyes. You mustn't ask that sort of question. When you are taken onto the established staff, you'll be told, not before. But I want to know now, Jason said in discontent. Do you know? Yes, I do, Miss Golden answered tantalizingly. Come on, or we shan't have finished the oat crisp layout by a quarter to and she stared firmly down at the copy in front of her, lips folded, candy floss hair falling over her face, lashes hiding eyes like peridots, a girl with a secret. Jason was annoyed. He rapped out a couple of rude and witty rhymes which Miss Golden let pass in a withering silence. What do you want for your birthday, Miss Golden? Sherry? Fudge? Bubble bath? I want to go away with a clear conscience about oat crisps. Miss Golden retorted. It was not true. What she chiefly wanted was Mr. Jason Ashgrove, but he had not realized this yet. Come on, don't tease. I'm sure you haven't been on the established staff all that long, he coaxed her. What happens when one is taken on anyway? Does the managing director have us up for a confidential chat? Or are we given a little book called The Awful Secret of Grimes Buildings? Miss Golden wasn't telling. She opened her drawer and took out a white towel and a cake of rosy soap. Wash hands, please, wash hands, please. Jason was frustrated. You'll be sorry, he said. I shall do something desperate. Oh no, you mustn't. Her eyes were large with fright. She ran from the room and was back within a couple of moments, still drying her hands. If I took you out for a coffee, couldn't you give me just a tiny hint? Side by side, Miss Golden and Mr. Ashgrove ran along the green-floored passages, battled down the white marble stairs among the hundred other employees from the tenth floor, the nine hundred from the floors below. He saw her lips move as she said something, but in the clatter of two thousand feet, the words were lost. Fire escape he heard, as they came into the momentary hush of the carpeted entrance hall, and it's to do with a bicycle, a bicycle and a harp. I don't understand. Now they were in the street, chilly with the winter dusk smells of celery on carts, of swept up leaves heaped in faraway parks, and cold layers of dew sinking among the withered evening primroses in the bombed areas. London lay about them, wreathed in twilight mystery and fading against the barred and smoky sky. Like a ninth wave, the sound of traffic overtook and swallowed them. Please tell me. But, shaking her head, 
she stepped onto a scarlet homebound bus and was borne away from him. Jason stood undecided on the pavement, with the crowds dividing around him as around the pier of a bridge. He scratched his head, looked about him for guidance. An ambulance clanged, a taxi hooted, a drill stuttered, a siren wailed on the river, a door slammed, a brake squealed, and close beside his ear, a bicycle bell tinkled its tiny warning. A bicycle, she had said, a bicycle and a harp. Jason turned and stared at Grimes' buildings. Somewhere he knew there was a back way in, a service entrance. He walked slowly past the main doors with their tubs of snowy chrysanthemums and up Glass Street. A tiny, furtive wedge of darkness beckoned him, a snicket, a hackett, an alley carved into the thickness of the building. It was so narrow that at any moment, it seemed, the overtopping walls would come together and squeeze it out of existence. Walking as softly as an Indian, Jason passed through it, slid by a file of dustbins, and found the foot of the fire escape. Iron treads rose into the mist, like an illustration to a gothic fairy tale. He began to climb. When he had mounted to the ninth story, he paused for breath. It was a lonely place. The lighting consisted of a dim bulb at the foot of every flight. A well of gloom sank beneath him. The cold fingers of the wind nagged and fluttered at the tails of his jacket, and he pulled the string of the fire door and edged inside. Grimes' buildings were triangular, with the street forming the base of the triangle and the fire escape the point. Jason could see two long passages coming toward him, meeting at an acute angle where he stood. He started down the left-hand one, tiptoeing in the cave-like silence. Nowhere was there any sound except for...